So for more on this then, I'm joined by Shirin Motara, who is a gender equality specialist as well as a feminist uh, strategist. Shirin, thank you for your time this morning here on All Angles. Let's start with a broader question before we get into the nitty-gritty of convert, converting the claims uh, by uh, the uh, women against um, uh, MSC Fritz into a, you know, possibly criminal uh, investigations. But a broad question, what have you made of the way that the matter has been handled uh, in the Western Cape by the Premier, by others involved uh, in trying to bring accountability and some answers around this question? Nigel Siswe, and thank you. Um, so there are two things I think that are important to highlight here. The first, of course, is the political angle of all of this. So we know that, um, you know, uh, political parties are going to use this as an opportunity to kind of flag their own moralism and so on. But actually, if you look at those political parties who are now raising the red flags and see how they've dealt with issues of this nature, then you do, then one does want to ask questions about, you know, are they really committed to addressing sexual harassment or is this just politics um, and, you know, playing power games? But the second is that this is just a reflection of the systemic problem that we have on um, gender-based violence, of which sexual harassment is part of. And the fact that, uh, in general, our country has a kind of a systemic nature around misogyny, around the way in which we treat women, the way, the, the way in which we trust or don't trust women's stories and what women tell us, and the way in which the DA and the Western Cape government has responded is, is exactly the way in which um, we see people in power responding in general. And it just highlights again the fact that, you know, women who are sexually, sexually harassed, women who are facing gender-based violence, have almost no power within the system, even though we have strong laws and so on, they have very little power to influence meaningful action and meaningful change. Uh, and so, you know, I think that what we are seeing is that our system, we have a structural problem of patriarchy, we have a structural problem of gender discrimination. And of course, in general, our leaders don't see it as, as being a, a critical issue and don't see how, um, across our society and the way in which we are doing things, um, this has an impact. Shireen, what have you made around the uh, level of detail to which, um, you know, the Premier Alan Windy has gone or not gone, uh, to be quite accurate, uh, in the last few days? Uh, I mean, when he acted, it was based on received serious allegations of a serious nature, and that's all we got. Did he have a responsibility of actually uh, specifying that these allegations are of sexual misconduct uh, towards, um, you know, employees, uh, particularly junior employees, or even to just say they are of a sexual nature? Uh, or did he not? Because his argument has been to say that, you know, it is meant to safeguard the anonymity of the complainants uh, who did not want to be identified, etc. Was the middle ground there where we get accountability and get to understand what exactly we're dealing with without violating the anonymity of the complainants? I think we have, we have a problem of gender-based violence in our country. We know how big the issue is and we know that, um, you know, it's getting very little... Um, attention from from the decision makers and so for the uh, premier and for Ellen Windy in particular I think it would have been important to um, to allude to the fact that this has for example a, a, a sexual harassment implication or a gender-based violence implication because we know how big the issue is in our country and the fact that these women have made the effort to come forward highlights exactly how critical it is for them to find resolution. And of course, we're hearing that this is not a new issue. It has happened before. And so we're hearing of cover-ups and so on. It is important for us to understand, even at this point when it is an allegation, we need to understand that it's a sexual harassment allegation. Because, of course, also from a legal perspective, we have specific laws that apply to that and therefore we want to be making sure that the premier or um, the DA are following the law in relation to this issue and also that we want to check do they have a proper sexual harassment policy and are they following that policy in relation to 
um, the complaints they have received. And Shirin, to the core of why we invited you here, uh, the conversation has been, uh, you know, we don't have the specific details, but the picture that is emerging has to do with sexual harassment. Um, and and uh, that, that's about as far as we know at this point. How difficult or how easy is it uh, to rightly categorize sexual harassment as a form of gender-based violence uh, with possibility of implications beyond just um, disciplinary processes and losing your job, but actually of a criminal nature in terms of consequences. How easy or how difficult is it uh, to draw that line uh, between you know, sexual harassment as it is applied in the workplace and actually a person facing criminal sanctions? So I think there are a couple of things there. The first is that the, the International Labour Organization has brought out a, 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 new, a new provision around this issue and have clearly categorized sexual harassment as a gender-based violence um, issue. So it is uh, seen as gender-based violence and therefore has to be addressed as such. And our country, we have signed up to that and therefore it applies to us as well. We're wanting to see, of course, how the Department of Labour um, integrates it into our current laws. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, you can lay criminal charges um, on um, for sexual harassment. So, so the, um, the people, the women that are affected have the ability to do that. But of course, also at an employer level or at an organizational level, like for example, for the DA, they have specific sexual harassment policies, uh, one hopes. And they have to follow the, um, the procedures in those policies. Now, what I'd like to say about that, though, is that what we find uh, and what we're seeing also happening is that this often becomes a very challenging process for the women who complain because, of course, they, com they are laying complaints into a system where the people of power hold, um, are the ones that are the making decisions, allocating the case to someone, uh, deciding what happens with the case and so on. So the, the extent to which you wonder if the case will be um, addressed in the right way, whether it will be fair, whether it will be just, whether these women will have support in order to make sure that the case is heard uh, by someone who is neutral. Um, those are the kinds of questions that one needs to raise now, but definitely sexual harassment is a form of gender-based violence, and I think we must stop fooling ourselves to think that when we talk of sexual harassment, it's some minor thing, and you know, why are women kicking up a fuss but it's actually quite serious. And what we know about sexual harassment, it's often about a, um, a behavior that consistently happens. And now we are hearing about, you know, there's, um, we are hearing allegations of this is not the first time and so on. And we do know that harassers in the workplace or in organizations, it's not that they often do it once, but they do it over and over. And part of the reason is because they are given that power by the organization who doesn't take any action. Shirin Matara, I'm glad we've spoken to you this morning. Thank you for your, uh, your time and your insights here on All Angles on ENCA. She was weighing in, of course, around the murky situation at this point in terms of detail. Uh, we don't know much. Uh, we've not been told much uh, around uh, the suspended MEC Albert Fred.